this topic will be pulmonary function test. This will be basically um, a practical oriented uh, session today. Okay, so everybody, you hear that there is pulmonary function test, but we hardly know what this test comprises of. So today, it's basically PFT or pulmonary function test and its components, and why do we use PFTs? Okay. So basically it's a broad term, it encompasses a wide variety of objective methods to assess basically lung function. So lung function in such the lung parenchyma, elastic tissue, chest wall, the muscles, the nervous system, basically it tests everything. Okay. So it provides an objective and standardized measurements for assessing the presence and severity of respiratory dysfunction. So different types are spirometry, pulse oximetry, blood gases or ADGs, lung volumes by helium dilution and body platysmography, exercise tests, diffusing capacity and bronchial challenge testing. So basically today will be uh, mainly focused on spirometry. So why do we do PFTs? Is to predict the presence of pulmonary dysfunction, to know the functional nature of disease, obstructive or restrictive to assess the severity of disease, to assess the progression of disease, to assess the response to treatment, to identify patients at, at increased risk of morbidity and mortality undergoing pulmonary resection. So basically, even before surgery, we have to do PFT normally. Okay. And then we also use PFT to wean patients from ventilator in ICU in medical legal cases to assess lung impairment as a result of occupational hazard or maybe because of accident also. Then epidemiological surveys to assess the hazardous to document incidents of disease, okay, to identify patients at perioperative risk of pulmonary complications. So basically it was done by Hutchinson initially, so this is just a salute of him performing the first parametry. Then we come into dynamic and static lung volumes. So first of all, we'll de deal with the dynamic. So spirometric cornerstone of all PFTs. Okay. So it was in invented by John Hutchinson. And then spirometry is a medical test that measures the volume of an air of air of an individual while inhaling or exhaling as a function of time. It is used to measure dynamic, also to measure dynamic lung volumes. Okay. So the most common performed maneuver uses force expiratory vital capacity or FVC in which subjects inhales maximally and exhales rapidly and completely as possible. So basically this is a dynamic lung volume study. Okay, so this falls under vital capacity, force vital capacity, force expiratory volume in one second and peak expiratory flow rate or PEFR. Then the FRC, RV and TLC also known as functional residual capacity, residual volume and total lung capacity. These are static lung volumes. Okay, the previous one is dynamic which is measured by the PFT or the spirometer. Then before testing a patient, what we have to do is we have to prior ex explain to the patient what procedure are we doing. He should not be smoking or inhale any bronchodilators six hours prior to the test to remove any tight clothing, waist belts or dentures which may obstruct the patient from performing the test. And patient should be seated comfortably and if obese or if, if it's a child less than 12 years, we prefer the patient to be standing. And what is to be avoided? Smoking for one hour. Patient should not be smoking and uh, should come to the test within one hour. Okay, He should have stopped smoking for more than one hour. You should have stopped alcohol for more than four hours. There should be no exercise within 30 minutes and preferably after a large meal after two hours. Okay, and patient should not wear any tight clothes. And how do we do it? Patient has to be seated comfortably. It is a closed circuit technique. We have to uh, place a nose clip on the nose. I'm not showing any diagram. I think you have seen, you have done in your physiology, physiology class in your first year. Then patient has to breathe on a the mouthpiece. They have to take a deep breath as fast as possible and blow out as fast as they can for a minimum of six seconds. Okay. 
So then the flow volume, what do we measure in a spirometry? So once the patient has done the test, we will see that different kinds of graphs are coming out. Okay. So what are those graphs? So we usually measure flow force vital capacity. Okay. So then we measure it in the graph according to time or as a function of lung volume. So we have flow volume curve where flow meter measures flow rate in liters per second upon exhalation and the flow is plotted as a function of volume. Then classic spirogram is volume as a function of time. So we have two graphs, one is flow volume time and volume as a function of flow as plotted as a function of volume. So basically if you see the picture on the left side, okay. So this is a flow volume curve. The graph on the top is the expiratory curve and the graph on the bottom is an inspiratory curve. So if you see the flow starts from 0 goes up to 6. Okay. So this is the maximum flow. Okay. So this goes up and, and with volume if you see below volume is plotted horizontally. If you see at 3 volumes or 3 liters the flow has gone down to 0. Okay. Then after that is signifying the end of exhalation. Okay. Then after that starts the inhalation. So that is a, at the bottom the curve bottom is the inhalation curve. Okay. So then if we take this flow volume with respect to time we can see that at 1 second if you see 0 1. Okay. The horizontal line is the time and the vertical line is the flow volume is the flow okay so at one second the flow rate the patient that uh, the amount of air that he can take out in one second is known as fev1 and the total amount of flow volume at the end of six seconds is taken as fvc okay so what is flow vital capacity so uh, initial, now this is just elaboration of the initial graph. So total volume of air that can be exhaled forcefully from a total lung capacity. Okay, so after taking a full inhalation, if the patient exhales fully and forcefully, okay, for more than six seconds, then we call it FVC. The majority of FVC can be exhaled in less than three seconds. Okay, if you see the graph, you see within at 3 seconds, patient has almost the flow volume is almost 4 4.5. Okay, so this is normal. But what, what happens in obstructive disease like COPD and asthma? This is this is less. Okay, so usually this is measured in liters. Then what is FEV1 or forced expiratory volume in one second? So volume of air forcefully expired from total inflation in the first second. Okay, so it's measured in liters. Normal people can exhale more than 75 to 80 percent of the FVC in the first second. So this is another important parameter that we measure. In fact, this is the most important parameter that we measure. Okay. Then what is forced expiratory volume 25 to 75 percent or FEF? 2575. This is the mean force expiratory flow during the middle half of the force vital capacity. Okay. If you see the diagram, the slope of the line is FEF 25 to 75%. Okay. This reflect this is effort independent. Okay, initially the FEV1 and the FVC, these are all effort dependent. Okay. So in the middle we have this FEF 2575, this is effort independent. Why it is important? Because it shows the status of the small airways. It is highly variable but it depends largely on the FVC. Okay. So the, basically we use this parameter to measure small airways. Okay. Then what is peak expiratory flow rate? This is an outpatient um, test that we can do in patients who are suffering from asthma. Okay. So patient comes to you with asthma, then you cannot do spirometry for all the patient because they have to be prepared and come to you. Okay. So what happens is there is a small 
a tube light thing where the patient has to blow and it measures the peak expiratory flow rate okay so they just have to blow into the tube and we can find out how much is their PEFR so basically this is used for asthma patients so what is it? It is a maximum flow rate achieved during FVC. It is used in asthmatics to identify the severity of airway obstruction and guide therapy. Okay, so we can both diagnose it, diagnose the patient and we can use it to follow up the patient also. So mainly dependent on patient effort. So that is the main limiting factor. Normal value is 10 liters per second or 600 liters per minute. It decreases with age and obstruction. That is airway obstruction. Then we have maximum voluntary ventilation or MVV. So what happens here is patient breathes as fast and as deep as possible for 12 to 15 seconds. It tests for overall lung function, ventilatory reserve capacity and air trapping. Okay. So normal is between 90 to 120 liters per minute. It is usually decreased in obstructive disorders, restrictive disorders and neuromuscular disorders. Another way of finding is uh, this value is if you multiply FEV1 into 40. Okay. So what happens is overall lung function and ventilatory capacity. So it usually depends on the lung elasticity, the strength, the effort that is given by the patient, which in turn is dependent on the muscles, strength of the muscle, expiratory muscles, inspiratory muscles. So it gives an overall picture. Okay. Then coming on to flow volume curves. So what does it signify? How, what, how can we interpret them? Okay. So it is, if you see, we have different kinds of spirometers. Some are handheld, some are uh, connected to a computer. Okay. So all the, but the mo common thing is they give us graphs. So how do we read those graphs? So they are standard on most desktop spirometers, adds more information than volume time curve. Less understood but not too difficult to interpret, better at demonstrating mild airflow obstruction. So if we see, this is a flow volume curve where the volume is in the horizontal axis and the flow rate is in the vertical axis. Okay, And the graph above is the expiratory flow, expiratory flow and the graph below is the inspiratory flow. Okay, So we are mainly concerned about the expiratory flow okay so what happens is when you ask the patient to blow as hard as possible patient will blow very fast so if you see if you can see okay initially it will start from zero it will go all the way up okay so that is the maximum expiratory flow or pefr okay then if we take one second that is known as fev1 okay so it goes up and goes down zero so that is when the expiration ends and then below the horizontal line another graph okay so that is the inspiratory graph okay so basically that is the flow volume curve we measure flow in respect to volume also known as flow volume loop okay this illustrates maximum expiratory and inspiratory flow volume curves useful to help characterize disease states like obstructive and restrictive disease. Okay, basically the same thing. So what happens is this is a flow volume time, volume time curve. Okay, so this is normal. If you see horizontally, this is the time, vertically it is the flow volume. Okay, so in one second, the uh, the thing that we measure is the FEV1. It is showing as 4 liters. And then force vital capacity is uh, 5 liters. Okay. Then if we take the ratio between these two, it is normally it is 80% or 0.8. Okay. So what happens in obstructive lung diseases? This ratio decreases. Okay. What happens in restrictive lung diseases? This ratio decreases but in proportionate to the value of FEV1 and FEV, FVC okay so this is the normal curve so sometimes what happens is patient may get tired and not able to perform the test properly but then we have a standard test where what we say is if the three we usually take three readings and if this three readings falls between five percent of the 
other two readings that is 100 ml plus minus 100 ml we take it as a take it as a reproducible test okay <coughs> then there's also called a, the things that i described are also known as dynamic lung volumes so why do we do this is because for any given individual there is a unique limit to the maximum flow that can be reached at any lung volume increasing flow force does not increase the flow unlike fe FEF 25-75%. Okay, flow decreases with decrease in lung volume due to dynamic compression of the airways. And force vital capacity maneuver makes the test reproducible and interpretable. Okay, so what happens is this test is reproducible. We can always uh, find same amount of or the almost the same amount of values when we do the test. Okay. Then features what what does it show what does it show us about the lung okay so it shows us the lung elasticity the size of the airways and resistance to flow along the airways so this is what we are measuring then what is the static lung volume okay this measures the absolute lung volumes which are often informative these are also known as vital capacity residual volume and total lung capacity i will describe this Okay, then we have another thing which is known as slow vital capacity. So this is maximum flow of air exhaled slowly and completely from maximum inspiratory level. Okay, it helps avoid air trapping. So what happens is, when you try to blow a balloon with open mouth, with a wide open mouth, you won't be able to fill air. But when you blow a balloon with your mouth uh, diameter smaller, you are able to push in more air. Okay, so that is one of the um, physics involved in doing this maneuver okay if you can understand this graph is in the second half of the graph the small waves are the the when the, when it goes up it is inspiration when it goes down it is expiration so what happens is the patient takes a long breath up then he slowly exhales it okay and then he continues his normal tidal volume okay this is tidal volume where the patient does not have maximal effort so what is different with this and fev1 is patient is doing it very slowly he is not doing it very fast and forcefully okay so we measure when we do this graph when we see this graph we can find any air trapping that is involved or it prevents air trapping okay so how do we predict the normal values for different kinds of people? So this is a standardized test for different people, different age, sex, ethnicity, weight, body surface area. Okay, so that's why we take into account the age, height, sex and the ethnic origin. So all these things are fed into the computer or the spirometer whereby we have to mention when you do a spirometry, we have to mention the all these values of the patient. So accordingly, they will show us whether patient is normal or abnormal or having any other disease. So how do we interpret it? It should begin with an assessment of test quality to inspect the graphic data. Okay, uh, This will be shown in the following slides. To ascertain whether the study meets certain well-defined acceptability and reproducibility standards. So what, what they say is when we do the test, there should be no coughing okay, during the first second then what is a good start is less than five percent of fvc exhaled prior to max expiratory effort that means before the patient exhales less than five percent of the air should be taken out of the machine okay no early termination of expiration that is it has to carry out for more than six seconds or it ha there has to be a plateau of two seconds flow rate should be consistent as fast as possible throughout exhale vital capacity okay good reproducibility or consistency of efforts that's what i told you it should be within 100 ml or 150 ml okay plus minus 150 ml then how do we interpret so step one we see first the values of fev1 and fvc okay so what happens if this ratio is low so according to goal criteria we say it is low if it is less than 70 percent for adults and less than 85 percent in patients of 5 to 18 years of age 
then other things you don't have to know you just have to know that if it's less than 80% just take it 80% for adults it is low and if it's less than 85% for people less between 5 and 18 years it is low okay so now we have to then step 2 is to determine if FVC is low okay so if FVC is less than the lower limit of normal for adults or less than 80% of predicted for 5 and 18 years it in indicates a restrictive pattern okay so restrictive pattern can indicate any restrictive lung disease like ILD it can be both obstructive and restrictive lung disease or it can be an obstructive lung disease with air trapping that means the air cannot come out from the lungs into the machine okay so then we have to confirm the restrictive pattern if the patient's initial PFT results indicate a restrictive pattern or a mixed pattern that is not conducted corrected with bronchodilators then patient should be referred for full PFTs with diffusion testing for carbon monoxide okay so DLCO testing that's how we call it then suppose there is obstruction okay patient has FEV1 by FVC ratio of less than 80 percent so that is saying that patient has obstruction now what we want to see is whether it is reversible or not reversible so what we will do is we will give the patient a bronchodilator inhalation okay or nebulization okay so after that again we'll do the test and what we will see is if the FEV1 is increasing by more than 12 percent and 200 ml from baseline and in children if it if the increase in FEV1 is more than 12 percent then we should well, then we tell it as reversible okay but what happens if a patient shows a mixed pattern so if the FEC corrects to 80 percent or more of patients in 5 to 18 years or the lower limit of normal or more in adults after bronchodilator use it is likely that the patient has pure obstructive lung disease with air trapping okay so then is step 5 we see the severity or how we grade the obstruction okay so mild is when FEV1 is greater than equal to 80 percent okay so moderate is between 50 percent and 80 percent severe is between 30 percent and less than 50 percent and very severe is when it is less than 30 percent so this is FEV1 okay then we see obstruction is there but then you're getting a mixed result it is not you're not sure that it is obstruction or restriction okay then what we can do is we can do a bronchoprovocation test so suppose you think that the patient has allergy or is asthmatic okay so we will try to induce that in a very safe way in a low dose manner okay so maybe because of exercise or allergen induced asthma then we can use this bronchoprovocation test so what we use is naturally if a patient has exercise induced asthma we'll ask him to exercise and then we'll do his spirometry again or we may use metacholine or we may use mannitol inhalation or eucapnic voluntary hyperapnic testing okay so what happens here is patient is in normal air and he is high he should hyperventilate okay so what happens here is carbon dioxide is washed out and the air inside your lungs becomes less humid so this also results in provocation then step 7 is establish differential diagnosis and then we can compare to his previous PFT results then another way of approaching this is how we see the curve okay so we see the curve and we can also give a rough idea patient may have obstructive or restrictive disease okay so here we do visual comparison of the individual flow volume curves to the normal predictive curve okay substantial loss of area so what we see is usually we see the normal curve super uh, I mean the abnormal curve superimposed on the normal curve okay so what we see is any loss of area concave shape of the flow volume curve and any uh, change in shape of the slope okay so next slide if you see properly so the normal is on the extreme left okay then we have obstruction restriction and mix so if you see the obstruction if you see the flow volume curve below okay so the line in the volume flow volume curve that is showed by a dotted line is the normal one and if you see this the obstruction 
the flow is not reaching the maximum it is maybe 80 percent of the maximum and then if you see the expiratory curve it is going in a curved manner okay but the inspiration is almost of the same shape as the normal curve okay so usually this we can roughly say or we can just make out that this is an obstructive study okay the next is restriction if you see the shape of the curve both expiration and inspiration is almost the same but the area is less than the normal curve okay so here it is purely a restrictive study okay the shape is almost the same only the area has decreased hmm. so this is restriction and then in mix you may have both the pictures okay so that is how we see the curves next is so how do we identify lesions from this curve we can there's another uh, useful thing that we can see with this curve is any obstruction that occurs during the in the respiratory system that is maybe intrathoracic or extrathoracic okay so just imagine a balloon okay so suppose there is a tumor outside the balloon and a, and one there's a tumor inside the balloon okay that is in the neck of the balloon just think of that okay so what happens is if that is a fixed obstruction it does not move with inspiration or expiration so what happens in inspiration is our airways are pulled horizontally laterally okay so the diameter is increased so usually what happens is on inspiration more air is going in okay so in expiration what will happen is the tumor will push down or our chest wall will push into the our airways will become smaller so what happens how will the tumor behave is if the ob obstruction is fixed if the airway obstruction is fixed it ne neither increases or decreases or obstructs the airway so during expiration and inspiration the volume the flow volume curve will be almost like this okay circular or how do you call it hexagonal or something like that okay so if there is a variable extra thoracic obstruction what do you mean by extra thoracic obstruction is suppose it is outside the lung or outside the airways when we blow air our airways is going to expand so there's no there's not going to be any problem while expiration but during inspiration less air will go in this obstruction will obstruct the airways okay so what happens in intrathoracic is just the opposite of what happens in extra thoracic okay the expiration part will be obstructed whereas the inspiration part will be normal so basically in these two curves we can find out these three curves we can find out whether there is a fixed obstruction or any variable obstruction that may be extra thoracic or intra thoracic so some of the examples of obstructive disorders are asthma emphysema and cystic fibrosis then restrictive disorders are mainly characterized by reduced lung volumes or decreased lung compliance. This may be interstitial fibrosis, scoliosis. So if, if you see this, if you see the first one, obstructive lung disease, this basically affects the lung parenchyma. But if you see the restrictive disorder, it affects both the lung parenchyma, the chest wall and the muscles also. Okay. So interstitial fibrosis affects the lung parenchyma. Scoliosis mainly a bony deformity, so it affects the chest wall, obesity also chest wall. Lung resection is like any pulmonary resection or you take out some part lobe of the lung. Okay, neuromuscular disorder where the um, muscles of inspiration and expiration are uh, weakened. Okay, then cystic fibrosis, they may show a mixed feature. So, okay, so these are the examples of obstructive and restrictive lung disorders. So if you see again, uh, just repeating, the normal versus obstructive versus restrictive. Okay, so if you see the normal curve, spirometry, usually this type of questions are given in your uh, NEET exams, okay, PG exams. So the first one on the extreme left, top extreme left, okay, so this is a normal curve of flow time curve, okay, and this one is a flow volume on the right is the flow volume curve, okay, so if you see in time so in one second what we get is four liters so this is known as fev1 okay so in four seconds 
in 4 seconds the patient is having a post vital capacity of 5 ok so then if we see the flow volume curve so as as the as 5 liters of air has been pushed out the flow becomes 0 ok so this is normal then if you see obstructive if you compare the normal to the obstructive the height of the curve is less okay in the flow time curve and the flow volume curve there is a significant the slope is depressed okay then if you see the restrictive pattern you see the height is also less okay and the time is also the amount is also less okay so in less than three seconds the patient has expelled or he can expel only two liters of air okay then if you see the flow volume curve you see the height the rate in which the flow is going is almost initially it is almost normal okay but the area is decreased okay and the slope is also maintained but then the area is decreased okay so these are some of the differences so basically if you see the graph like this you can make out whether it's an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease so what happens is some graphs some patients are not able to comply properly and they're not able to give good graphs so what are those kind of things let's see so the normal is a marked in red and this the black one is the abnormal one okay so patient is not giving enough effort okay so that's why the curve is so low okay and inadequate he is not taking out is not giving full force and for adequate amount of time that is more than five seconds okay then and it is accompanied by a slow start so it is not starting from zero okay then what happens here is patient has stopped early okay patient did not fully blow for five seconds or six seconds okay then here again this is a slow start the black one is the abnormal one then what happens here is patient has cuffed okay so it is a jack curve then patient has taken an extra breath and then again started the test in between okay so it has to be a smooth line then coming on to the static lung volumes so these are vital capacity residual volume and total lung capacity so this kind of uh, lung volumes are cannot be measured by the spirometry then slow vital capacity I have already um, explained okay so lung, lung residual volume what is the residual volume is it is the volume of air remaining in lungs after maximum exhalation so when a patient finishes your spirometry that is after the breath he has taken out the breath maximally the amount of air that is remaining in the lungs is the residual volume okay so how do we measure this i'll show you in the following slides then another is the functional residual capacity that is the sum of the residual volume and the expiratory reserve volume or the volume of air in the lungs at the end expiratory tidal position okay so that means suppose you have normal respiration you have exhaled so the amount of air that is remaining in the lungs is your FRC then suppose you have taken a deep inspiration and deep expiration okay so the amount of lungs uh, air remaining in your lungs in the residual volume okay then total lung capacity is the sum of all volume okay so TLC residual volume FRC everything okay so what happened why is it important is it is increasing obstructive lung disease obviously because air cannot go out like COPD emphysema and asthma okay it is decreased with respect restrictive disorders so what happens here if you have seen the graph before restrictive lung disease air as such very less amount of air is going in and very less amount of air is going out okay so if you see the graph if you see the graph for restrictive lung disease if you see this graph on the middle okay so basically what happens is expiration and inspiration the area has decreased 
but proportionately means almost the same shape but only the value has the quantity has decreased okay so that one that is the pathology in restrictive lung disease whereas in obstructive lung disease what happens is the air residual volume okay frc all will increase okay so it is the sum of vital capacity and the residual volume so how do we measure the lung capacity basically we don't need you don't need to know you just need to know the different uh, methods by which we use so one is radiographic method another is platysmography i think you must have heard this in your physiology class then nitrogen washout technique and then we have the helium dilution technique okay so you have to know this by name this three four methods okay so i will not go into details of this this is in body platysmography use uh, boys law patient is uh, sitting inside a closed um, tube or a box okay so minimal amounts of pressure changes can be measured and we can measure the residual volume total lung capacity okay so what is the advantage of platysmography it measures total lung capacity and residual volume okay it measures essentially all the gases in the lungs including that in poorly ventilated area so one thing you know i think anatomical dead space and physiological dead space so even those things can be measured with platysmography okay so in copd total lung capacity frc and rv are obtained by this method are larger as compared to other techniques obviously okay so resistance to airways and compliance can also be measured another thing is the diffusion capacity so what happens is as we all know we have to breathe because we have to take out carbon dioxide and take in oxygen so basically how we measure this diffusing capacity that is air going in from the lungs into the rbcs is by by the diffusing of carbon monoxide why we do this is because this gas is highly soluble okay so we measure the dlco okay or diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide so it measures ability of lungs to transport inhale gas from alveoli to pulmonary capillaries normal is 20 to 30 milliliters per minute per millimeter of mercury okay so it basically depends on the alveolar capillary membrane so if this is thick and inflamed carbon monoxide will not exchange okay the thickness of the membrane and the driving pressure of the aa alveolar arterial gradient okay so this can be measured by single breath method or sbd dlco okay so what happens is subject exhales the residual volume that inhales a gas mixture containing carbon monoxide after inhalation to total lung capacity the subject holds the breath for 10 seconds and exhales completely samples of exhaled gas is collected and analyzed analyzed for carbon monoxide so dlco can be found out by a ratio of vco by paco and p small aco so vco is the rate of disappearance of carbon monoxide paco is the alveolar concentration of carbon monoxide and paco is the partial pressure of carbon monoxide in the rbc or in the blood okay so by this method we can find out the dlcos so in which lung conditions dlco is decreased okay so we have obstructive lung disease parenchymal lung disease obviously because in obstructive lung disease like emphysema the alveolar uh, epithelium is destroyed okay and parenchymal lung disease like pneumonia it is alveolars are filled with pus or filled with consolidation of all those fibrotic tissues so gas will not exchange okay any pulmonary vascular disease suppose there is a pulmonary thromboembolism okay Com one uh lobe of the lung is completely the vessel is completely blocked so that time also gas exchange will not take and of course anemia where the hemoglobin is so low that exchange of gases is very minimal okay then in increased conditions what will happen in asthma basically asthma there is no pathology in the alveolar okay it is mainly in the airways so at that time it may be normal but what happens is patient is breathing very hard and there is hyperventilation so there may be increased dl co okay pulmonary hemorrhage so what happens if there is blood in the alveoli there is more rbcs for exchange of gases okay and another same similar feature is polycyt polycythemia okay more red blood cells okay more hemoglobin so exchange will take place more 
okay then we have left to right shunt so basically this uh, increased cases of DLCO are cases where there is increased supply of blood to the lungs okay then coming on to the bronchial provocation test okay so here we assess the hyper responsiveness by administration of a stimulus this may be a chemical or may, may be a physical exercise okay so why do we use this because we have to confirm diagnosis of asthma when it is not clear cut so but we don't do it in certain conditions like if there is absolute airflow limitation if FEV1 is less than 50 percent so if you induce bronchopropagation in this patient patient will stop breathing or there will be complete obstruction okay then if there is stroke if patient is very uh, hypertensive if there's a vascular aneurysm okay so these are contraindications then relative contraindications are like pregnancy upper respiratory tract infection lower respiratory tract infections moderate airflow limitations when FEV1 is less than 60 percent okay so these are some of the relative contraindications so what do we do here is we can challenge the airway directly okay so either we induce metacholine or histamine okay so in direct causes what we do is we release mediators okay we provoke the bronchial uh, epithelium with like exercise or eucapnic voluntary hyperventilation which i already told you and we can also do this by inducing hypertonic saline okay then what what do we do how, uh, metacholine test how do we do this this is the most widely most widely used okay and this is consists so what we have to do is first of all we have to do a spirometry beforehand and then when we give this chemical how do we give this initially we give 0.031 or 0. Point, or 0. 0.0625 milligram per ml is used okay and the doses are increased two to four fold until fev1 falls by 20 percent from baseline or when 16 milligram per ml is reached okay so here you will see so if patient does not have pc20 is the provocating concentration okay so if it's more than 16 milligram per ml it is normal okay even that is in spite of giving 16 patient is normal so there is no hyper there is no uh, what you call bronchoconstriction okay then if it's less than one or between four and one then we say that this is a positive bronco responsive test okay then the other test for uh, measuring the inspiratory and expiratory volume i mean uh, muscles are this is one kind of um, what you call it device where it is used so what happens here is for expiratory muscles the subject inhales maximally and holds the rubber tubing firmly against the mouth and exhales as hard as possible so highest positive pressure is maintained for 0 0.9 second is recorded okay so that is the mouthpiece you see and that is the gauge that you will see there okay gauge or gauge that pi max is the subject exhales to residual volume holds the rubber tubing against the lip and sucks as hard as possible the highest negative pressure sustained for two seconds is recorded okay so here is why we do this is usually to wean the patient from ventilators okay so this is a bedside test okay in cases of neuromuscular diseases okay so values are less than minus 20 centimeters of water and uh, expiratory uh, muscle of uh, plus 50 centimeters water are favorable so the other uh, pulmonary function tests are like 6 to 12 minute walk test stair climbing exercise oximetry ventilatory reserve test okay then nitrogen washout closing volume and abgs okay these are basically rarely done but you should know the names then suppose a patient is very sick we cannot um, conduct spirometry so there are some other tests whereby we can assess or we have a rough idea of how is the patient's um, pulmonary function okay so basically what we have is a uh, subres breath holding test okay what happens here is patient is take to take a deep breath and hold the breath for as long as you can if the patient can hold for more than 25 seconds it's normal 15 to 25 is limited and less than 15 seconds a patient has very poor cardiopulmonary reserve okay so this is one of the uh, very crude tests then we have single breath count again almost the same thing 
if the patient is asked to take a deep breath and hold it and then we count it if we can count if we count till 40 seconds then it is normal and it indicates good vital capacity okay then we have a match blowing test we light up a match from a distance of 15 centimeters or 6 inches with open uh, mouth patient is asked to blow the match okay so it has the chin has to be supported no pursing of lips no head movement no air movement in the room okay so so if the patient cannot blow out a match in 6 inches then FEV1 is less than 1.6 liters okay if patient is blow, able to blow out a match in the 6 inches distance then FEV1 is more than 1.6 liters okay so then we have different modified tests okay then another is the cuff test patient is asked to take a deep breath and asked to cuff so we strength we see the strength of the cuff is effectiveness okay so if cuff is in inadequate then FEVC is less than 20 FEV1 is less than 15 PEFR is less than 200 ml okay so what roughly what we say is vital capacity is three times the tidal volume for effective cuff then we have the force expiratory time um, after a deep breath patient is asked to exhale maximally and forcefully and we keep a stethoscope near the trachea and listen okay so patient has to try to um, exhale as much as possible so usually what happens in normally it lasts for three to five seconds in obstructive lung disease it lasts for more than six seconds in restrictive lung disease it lasts for less than three seconds okay then we have the right peak flow meter i'll show you this is the one and then we have the dobonos vessel okay so what happens is we measure the pefr just like i told you in the opd this is for asthma mainly so normally males is between 450 and 700 females is between 350 and 500 so if it is less than 200 ml usually we can say that patient has inad inadequate cough efficacy or there is an obstruction also then next is the Dobono whistle blowing test. It also measures PEFR. Patient is asked to blow down a whistle blow tube at the end 